This is a Fox 10 News Alert. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to News Now. We are starting out in Orlando, Florida, with some breaking news this morning. Police and fire officials confirming to our sister station, Fox 35, there is an overturned Lynx bus on I-4. Again, this is on the I-4 near Orange Blossom Trail. There were passengers inside the bus at the time of the crash. They say that nine people were taken to area hospitals, none of them, though, with life-threatening injuries. So little good news there. Hazmat crews are on the scene because of an oil leak. They will stay there until the bus is upright, and they will also remove any debris. But if you know anybody that is in this area of Orlando, please let them know that traffic is impacted and there is heavy traffic in the area, as you can imagine. But this is some breaking news out of Orlando and these aerials courtesy of our sister station out there. So we wanted to provide them to you at the beginning of the show on News Now. I am currently joined by Ron Hoon. Ron, it has been a very busy morning. Boy, no kidding. You know, Pilar, it's the kind of thing where you look at those pictures and you think, well, how could something like that happen? You have such a heavy bus. I mean, it's loaded most of the time with passengers, yeah. uh, and it's such a heavy vehicle, but it's right over there on its side. The key here, though, as you look at those pictures, you didn't see a scattered field of debris. Right. That's when you know that another vehicle or a couple of other vehicles might have been involved. There's a little bit of damage over there on the concrete barriers. Uh, at what would be what about the 10 or 11 o'clock position uh, that's uh, just off from where the bus is and it is on its side and it, you know there's a little bit of concern with the fuel leaking and you can see they've put the foam down well, as a result of it he has mapped uh, concerns but Pilar I mean compare this to the story that we keep following for you just up the road just beyond Wickenburg uh, where when we showed the pictures earlier this morning of a horrific crash on the main highway between here and Las Vegas uh, the debris area Pilar to me looked like it stretched 200 yards yeah I mean the length of at least one football field maybe two and that was a fatal accident. It did shut that road down for many, many hours. Primarily, um, you know, they they have a long-term plan on how to fix that roadway, which is right now is a two-lane road, and it's so busy. Do you know, Pilar? Oh, I see you got some of those pictures. Uh, do you know that uh, the, we are the two largest cities in America to not be connected by an interstate freeway? Yeah. Phoenix, Phoenix and, and Las, Las Vegas. Vegas. And I've done that drive plenty of times. Correct. And I used to avoid it like the plague, but I will say ADOT's done a fantastic job of improving the road on a sort of a mile by mile basis. So that a good stretch of it now, especially as you get up closer to Wikiup, is full on freeway for many, many, many miles. Yeah. In fact, when I drove it last time now, coming north out of Wikiup toward Kingman, they're working hard on more miles to turn it into freeway. Eventually, the whole thing will be freeway from right here in Phoenix to basically downtown Las Vegas on what they're calling Interstate 11. But unfortunately, not all sections of the road are to that state yet. And this is not the first time that we've seen a fatal accident on that stretch of roadway. Uh, there was a UPS truck that was involved. Uh, there was a large semi. Most of the trucks, take a look at this, by the way. Look at the all backup. All the trucks. And that shows you at 4 in the morning, it's mostly almost all truck traffic. Yep. And you can't blame the truckers. They're trying to be out there, uh, you know, in the hours where traffic is not so heavy with everybody else. Right. You know, they're trying to get their job done in kind of quieter times. Uh, but boy, a lot of them got stuck in this backup. Yeah. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's just a sad story. Uh, there is a long-term plan to fully complete that roadway and turn it into freeway. But it's, uh, it can be, uh, honestly, I've driven it so many times, it can be a little dicey and a little dangerous when cars do try to pass right in that stretch, which by the way, if you've driven it, what are we talking about? It's in that area right as you approach the Joshua Tree Parkway. So if you visualize those signs, then you have a pretty good idea of where we're talking about. They do have signs up already that say future site, future home of I-11, Interstate 11. Correct. They're already up there. So yep. they let drivers know, hey, yep. we're working, we've acknowledged it, we're yep. going to make some improvements. And if you haven't driven it lately, we should point out, Nevada is doing more than their fair share as well. They just opened within, I think, about the last, say, 10 to 12 months, a whole new stretch of freeway so that once you cross the Colorado River and immediately enter into Nevada, you no longer have to drive through downtown Boulder. Right. So you have the, 
you had the st there was a stoplight. I mean, you're traveling on this busy road. All of a sudden, there's a stoplight in downtown Boulder, and you got to hit what 25 or 35 miles an hour. That whole loop has been completed. Yeah. I mean, the road to Vegas gets better every year, and eventually, this part will as well. We're on the top talker, the top news out of. Well, pretty much the whole state of Texas, but Dallas in particular this morning. A verdict finally down in the Amber Geiger case, guilty of murder. Mm -hmm. You know what's interesting? I did think that um, the defense put as good a case together as they could. This is one little sidelight in reading some of the coverage that I thought was quite fascinating and actually was brilliantly thought through on the defense's part, basically, trying to uh, save Amber Geiger from a, what could ultimately be basically a life sentence. And they went through and they interviewed, I believe about 270 residents of the apartment building where Botham John lived and where Amber Geiger lived. And they said that they found, of the 270 or so people that they interviewed, they found that more than 10% of the people that they talked to had reported um, getting on the wrong floor of the building because it's all so kind of cookie cutter right. and looks the same, uh, and and trying their key card in a in the wrong spot. Mm -hmm. So um, you know they tried to make the argument that hey it is not unbelievable that somebody would enter the wrong apartment. Yeah. However, the prosecution countered Pilar, and I know you've watched this case closely, and I know a lot of our viewers have been watching some of our streaming coverage, yeah. but the prosecution countered with an e perhaps even more effective argument. Okay, you made a mistake. You went in the wrong apartment. So why do you immediately pull your gun out and kill somebody? Right, you had other options. Why don't you stop? If you pull, if you pull out your gun, stop, you know, and order the person to put their hands up, or get down on the ground, or... Um, hey, how about the taser? I believe she had a taser on her. Police radio for help. How about the police radio for help? How about, um, there were just so many other options than killing a man who was sitting there eating ice cream. Yeah. So she's sobbing. You saw it. We carried it. Some of her statements on the witness stand. Um, you know, she had said it had been a very long shift that she had worked. But again, the prosecution looked into it and they said, well, actually, she had been texting her husband uh, and um, kind of some, frankly, sort of some steamy texts about what they had planned for later that night. And they said that she was more distracted as a result of that. So there were many different aspects to this particular case. And there she is, by the way, in the apartment as the police dash cam showed her frankly almost hyperventilating when yeah. she realized what she had done. It's a sad story all the way around. Our sister station is reporting that cheers erupted in the courthouse as the verdict was announced and someone yelled thank you Jesus in the hallway outside the courtroom where yeah. Geiger was tried. Yeah. A crowd celebrated and said black lives matter and raised voices when the prosecutors walked into the hall they broke into cheers. So you know um, when you think about it there are so many cases when you have an officer on duty responding to a crime scene where um, where the officer reaches for their weapon and they feel their they feel their life is endangered and frequently if a pro if a case is brought many times the case is not brought at all but if there is a case brought jurors will quite often tend to side with the officers because they realize we're living in a pretty violent time uh, you know, and they, they appreciate the pressure that officers are under. But in this particular case, she was off duty. She had so many other options. And in fact, she was trained. This is not somebody who had no training in a weapon and who had no training in police techniques to know how to kind of de-escalate the situation. If anybody could have handled it better, it would have been a police officer. Taking a live look now inside the courthouse. We've already heard from the lawyers for Botham John's family. So now we are waiting to see if we hear from prosecutors. We're waiting to hear how quickly the sentencing phase is going to start. You and mm -hmm. I were just talking about it. You'd think since they have all the jurors there, they've got the judge there, they've got everybody there that mm -hmm. would start mm -hmm. immediately. Are they gonna come back another day? Mm -hmm. But they, the jury barely got a chance to start debating the verdict yesterday. Yeah. And, you know, we were still all eyes on the courtroom wondering would the verdict come down last night, yesterday, but I think everybody kind of knew it was going to take a little bit of time. Yeah. So it it didn't take long, did it? No. I mean, they had a few hours yesterday, but uh, 
by uh, what would have been about 11 o'clock this morning, uh, Dallas time. Yeah. You know, they had their verdict. So, yeah, we'll watch for the final phase of the trial here. But, you know, I mean, there's great sadness in the family and amongst the friends of Botham John, but they do at least get the sense that, uh, that justice has been served. We're on possibly the tweet of the morning. <laughs> yes, uh, he certainly has a way. To, I wonder if he actually put that together, right himself, you know, or, or if somebody else uh, put the font over it. Uh, but the president was basically trying. It's also very interesting that now even his Twitter account has become wrapped up in presidential politics. Kamala Harris and I think another member of the Democratic Party uh, have been talking about, hey, it's time for Twitter to suspend the president's account. I don't think they could do that. He has. By the way, remember when he became president, he was talking about how he had 30 million followers and it's such an effective way to reach people? Yeah. I looked today just to see since his presidency began, he's well over 60 million wow. followers. And so, it, you know, I mean, there are about 300 million people in the country. So when you have 60 million followers, you got a pretty good chunk of the country who basically, if they're on social, they see what you have to say. But his argument is, if you are going to kick out of office, which has never happened in our nation's history, if you are going to say the will of the people has to be overturned because uh, the situation is so serious in the White House. Um, we've had impeached, we had Bill Clinton impeached, Senate did not remove him from office. We had Andrew Johnson impeached after Abraham Lincoln was assassinated and he couldn't get along with Congress, he got impeached, but they didn't remove him, the Senate didn't remove him. Donald Trump would be the first ever. We're a long way from that and Republicans do hold the Senate. Uh, but even just the fact that the polls are starting to show growing numbers of people in favor of the inquiry, frankly, and growing numbers of people in favor of removal from office. The president put this out today to say, just remember, if you look across this nation, look how red America was when it voted in 2016. 2016. Yeah. And for those who don't have their eyes on the television, they could just be listening to us. This yeah. is a uh, map of the U.S. with all the counties that voted Republican versus Democrat in 2016. And yeah. it reads, try to impeach this from the at real Donald Trump Twitter account, which, mm -hmm. by the way, he has two Twitter accounts. You know that, right? The official POTUS one. Oh. Yes, that's right. But he uses this one. This is the one everybody keeps their eyes on. Yeah, sure. The, yeah, the real Donald Trump. And yeah. this video I've been showing is from a protest, impeach Trump protest, right here in Phoenix this morning. Okay. Yeah, well, people are certainly fired up about it. And, it, you know, I mean, he got a lot of pushback for even hinting that it, that it could lead to civil war in the nation uh, if he is impeached. There would be a lot of his supporters who would be really upset about it. Um, you know, and there are some people, Pilar, I mean, from a p purely political viewpoint who, who look at it, and maybe they're a little cynical, but they say um, it only is going to score points with the base for you to do impeachment for the Democrats. And for the Republicans who hold the Senate, it'll potentially score points if you don't impeach him. Yeah. You know, if you said, look, he, di he did wrong, but we're not going to overturn the will of the voters. So, I mean, each each side has a chance to appeal to their base in this whole process. It, at the end of the day, will we end up with a President Pence six months from now? It seems highly unlikely with Republicans continuing to gain control of the Senate. Ron, have you ever been to the Welcome to Las Vegas sign? Uh, it's on the Strip. I guess I'm sure I've driven by it. But, but you've never yeah. been to it? Because it's such a... Um like to stop location. and take a picture yeah. or whatever. It's all the way down kind of by the airport, It's very isn't it? south. Yes. And um, it's, it's so, a happy place for a lot of people because yeah. it's iconic. Yes, You right. know, you think of Las Vegas. Yeah. Um, this morning, the scene there was entirely different. Yeah. Um, beautiful, moving tribute. But as we know, it's been two years since the uh, Las Vegas mass shooting. And these are the crosses, 58 of them placed at that Welcome to Las Vegas sign to honor the victims of the October 1st shootings. Yeah. Well, um, we've had so many mass shootings in recent years, but this one, of course, stands out for all the wrong reasons, the worst. And you know, Pilar, in our nation's history, um, if, you, uh, if you think of the word traitor, 
frequently people think of Benedict Arnold, you know, who turned on his country in the, in the days of the Revolutionary War, and becoming a Benedict Arnold basically meant you were a traitor to your nation. I wonder if, if when people think back years from now, generations from now, um, on, on the word coward, who could be more cowardly than someone who would slaughter people from high above them, knowing they had no chance to defend themselves, even if there were people who were armed themselves? Uh, they had no chance to turn around and suddenly try to figure out where their shots were coming from. It was as cowardly a person and a situation, I think, as any of us have ever heard of in our lifetime. These crosses, sorry to interrupt you, Ron. Yeah. They were created by Illinois carpenter Greg Zanis, who's designed similar crosses following other mass shootings. And I must say, one of the last stories I covered in Texas uh, before moving back to Arizona was the Sutherland Springs Church shooting. Oh, d is that right? And there were crosses yes. like this at oh. the scene there. And when you see that, it uh, kind of stinks because yeah. it represents every single person. And so um, he says this is a way to make sure people don't forget about being Vegas strong. And this is the third set of 58 crosses for Las Vegas. One set is at the Clark County Museum. The other set went to victims' families. And he says that he picked the Welcome to Las Vegas sign because it's the symbol of Vegas. Yeah. So absolutely heartbreaking. It really is. And, um, you know, at some point, will uh, this trend will fade away in our nation. I, tr I truly believe that, but it's pretty tough for literally hundreds of families. Yeah. Taking a live look now at our current uh, weather conditions here in the Valley. Ron, thanks for joining us. More news now is going to be just moments away.